Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Kubernetes Operator Framework Workshop. This is presented by Red Hat. Uh, my name is Matt Dorn. I am a principal engineer at Red Hat. Uh, I am doing this presentation with Michael Rivnack, senior principal software engineer at Red Hat. We also have two other Red Hatters here to help out you all. Um, senior engineers Rose, Crisp, and Melvin Hillsman are in the chat. Any questions you have throughout this presentation and workshop, feel free to put them into the chat. And Rose uh, and Melvin will be happy to help you. Hopefully you're in the right place. Today we're gonna learn about the operator framework and how it can help you build operators. But before we get started, we just wanna take a little bit of a poll if you could just put a plus one in the chat, if you have access to the chat to let us know uh, where you're coming from here today. So how many people here use Kubernetes and OpenShift regularly? If you use Kubernetes or OpenShift regularly, go ahead and put a plus one in the chat. Go ahead and put a plus one in the chat. If you use those regularly, go ahead and put a plus one in the chat there. just so we can get an idea so we all know where you're coming from with your experience. There. And I'm gonna try to see if I can get the chat on my phone so I can see if I can see the responses, but that will at least give our, um, our Red Hatters an idea of where you're coming from. How about anyone developing Golang? Do we have any Golang developers here today? Any gophers? Any Golang developers? Plus one, plus one in the chat. How about use Ansible regularly? Anyone here use Ansible? Ansible. Plus one in the chat if you use Ansible. Anyone here ever attempted to build a custom Kubernetes controller from scratch? Anyone? Building a custom Kubernetes controller from scratch which can take a lot of work. And we're gonna learn how the operator framework makes this process easy for you. And then plus one in the chat, if anyone has tried the operator SDK, Ansible operator or Helm app operator yet. Anyone ever played around with these? If you played around with them, go ahead and put a plus one in the chat. Okay. So our goal here in this session is to help you succeed with our tools. So in this entry level session, we're going to be exploring the operator framework, the operator framework. Now, before we get started, we just wanna leave you, we wanna go ahead and give you, first of all, this is a workshop. You're gonna be getting the environments right after the introduction, and we're gonna ensure that you can all connect to those environments. So for right now, we're gonna do a brief intro. You're also going to be getting the slides and we're going to show you where you can get those slides. These are some of the uh, support channels that you all can use for getting help on Kubernetes Slack. It's Kubernetes operators. We also have Google groups and we have the OpenShift Commons operator framework, which is, which is every third Tuesday of the month at 9 a.m. Pacific. And again, you'll be getting a copy of all this in the slides. So don't worry if you miss it. So let's go ahead and start out this talk with what an operator actually is. So if you go ahead and look up a Kubernetes operator, you'll get kind of like this formal definition that says an operator represents human operational knowledge in software to reliably manage an application, right? But what does that mean? What does that mean? Um, when we actually go ahead and say, what does that mean? I mean, this is kind of the generic, you know, uh, definition. Like, what are we actually talking about here? To really know what we're talking about here, um, we're gonna go ahead and we are going to go back a few years. Back into 2016 on the CoreOS blog, for many of you that may not know what CoreOS is, CoreOS was a startup in San Francisco that specialized in an operating system called Container Linux. And Container Linux 
business's goal was to just run containers. That's all it did. It just ran containers and it was very secure. It had auto updates turned on by default. There was no package manager on the host because the assumption was that if you wanted to run something, you ran it via container. And as you all or may not know, uh, Red Hat acquired CoreOS uh, a few years ago. So on that blog, uh, Brandon Phillips, CTO of CoreOS, uh, wrote, um, that there's this new type of software called operators, this new type of software called operators. And it says the operator built upon, is built upon the basic Kubernetes resource, controller, and application-specific knowledge concept. That this thing is a, it's a uh, type of software that builds on these three concepts. So what are these three things? a Kubernetes resource, or specifically a custom resource, okay? Um, controller, controller, a Kubernetes controller. We're gonna talk about what that is in here. And then knowledge, knowledge. So a Kubernetes resource, a controller, and knowledge. Well, let's talk about what each one of these are. Uh, what do we mean by resources in Kubernetes? Well, first of all, you have the concept of a pod, right? That's the, the single unit, the lowest unit that we use for deploying our workloads is the pod. What is the pod? Well, a pod is really one container or multiple containers, right? We know that containers in a pod share the same um, network stack. They, sh they share the same host name. They share the same inter-process communication, right? Also, we have the config map. Config map is great for storing application data, right? It's great for storing information that we can attach, could be a config file, could be something of that sort that we attach to our pod, right? And thus give access, our containers access to, to consume. What else do we have here? We have a route. A route gives us access to our workloads that are running within the cluster without routes also known as ingress, for those of you that may just use regular Kubernetes, our users would not be able to get access to our apps. So they allow that type of accessibility from outside the cluster. These are all examples of resources in Kubernetes, right? Now, what are controllers? Well, these are also considered resources, but they're resources that are powered by something called a controller. What is a controller? Well, think about the replica set. For those of you that may be unfamiliar with this, we understand that the replica set allows us to specify the number of pods that we want running, right? You put the number of pods you want are replicas because we know that two is one and one is none. We want high availability, right? We want the ability to scale. We know that if something goes down, we want it to easily come up for our stateless workloads. That's a replica set, right? That's a replica set. The controller, the replica set controller, ensures that that number is always running. And we're going to learn about that coming up here. What about the daemon set controller? What is the daemon set controller doing? When a user goes and creates a daemon set and ensures that a pod is running on every node in the environment, the controller ensures that, right? So when a pod dies, it will get respawned on that node. Or when an administrator adds a new plus or adds a new node to that environment, maybe bare metal, maybe an AWS instance that a pod will be spawned on there. And then we have the deployment. What is the deployment? The deployment is great because it allows for server side rollouts and deployments ensure that if one of our replica sets go down, they get recreated. So there's a deployment controller that is always watching the Kubernetes API and ensuring that. So these are the controllers and there's many of them running simultaneously in your Kubernetes cluster, right, at all times. And then we have the domain or application specific knowledge, the last requirement for an operator. And this is very important because the whole idea of an operator is that it gets rid of all the manual or work or toil that you have when managing your app. All the headaches that you get in the middle of the night when you have to wake up and go do something, go maybe restart a service or figure out why something is broken. Well, the operator does that because you have coded, right? all of this information into it. Not just the installation and the ensuring that it gets running, but the scaling properly. And what do we mean by scaling properly? We're talking about the fact that if you're running a stateful workload, that 
just coming up and down and blindly spinning up a new pod when one dies, similar to a replica set, may not be appropriate, right? You may have a particular cadence or rhythm to the way that your database pods should come up. You are going to program that because only you know how your app should properly scale. You're going to determine that. Self-healing, when something goes wrong, maybe a database becomes corrupted or something like that. Cleaning up, when it actually goes and creates resources. Updating to a new version, right, of your application that's running. Backing up, because we know that if, you're, if your information is just stored on that cluster and that cluster gets destroyed, you're out of luck. So you want to have offsite backups. And of course, if you're doing backups, you want to do restore and all of that good stuff. Okay, so this right here, those of you who know and love Kubernetes, I know that you've all have seen this many times, right? This is the resource schema. This is the object, the fun, this kind of fundamental unit that we use for interacting and creating things in Kubernetes, right? Via the API. It consists of four parts, right? The first part is called the GVK, AKA the type meta. This is where you specify the group version in kind. We have a group version, in this case, extensions V1 beta one, because it's a way to disambiguate different kinds that may be similar, right? So in this case, extensions V1 beta one is the API endpoint for the kind of replica set. We also have metadata, AKA object meta. This is where you put the name of your object and also the namespace where it's gonna reside. We know that namespaces, AKA projects in the OpenShift world are great for doing multi-tenancy, right? You may have a namespace for the human resources or development or production. It's a way to separate your objects. We also have another section here called the spec. This is really important because we also know this as the declaration. This is where you as a user go and declare what you want. In this case, we're saying we want five replicas that all use an Nginx image and have a label that's app equals Nginx. And of course, there's the status section. As regular users, we don't really modify the status section, but it's there to tell us what's going on and to tell us what the current state of the environment is. You're gonna learn that when you go and build an operator, it's your job to go and update the status. Okay, it's your job to go and update the status. That's when you're building a controller. A regular user is not going to update this, but again, the controller that we're gonna build in here is going to do that to provide information to our users. So remember we said that one of the requirements of an operator is that it, an operator uh, takes advantage of resources? Well, specifically, it takes advantage of something called custom resource definitions a very, very powerful feature in Kubernetes. CRDs allow us to extend the Kubernetes API. For example, this right here is an example of Grafana, kind Grafana. We know that the kind Grafana, you know Grafana, it's used to visualize uh, metric data, right? So we can get a nice visualization, typically for monitoring. This is not something you get out of the box with Kubernetes. But what you can do is build your very own custom resource, right? In this case, someone has built one called Grafana that allows you to put in all the details for your Grafana application, whatever it may be. So this is a complete customization that a user has provided that has become a resource on the API. And they've done this without even needing to bring down the API source code and recompile it. Really, really powerful. So let, let's show you how you would do this. You can actually extend the Kubernetes API by creating our very own object and resource via something called a CRD or custom resource definition. So if you look at this process, it should make sense, okay? First of all, if we actually go, we say cat my new CRD.yaml, if we say cat my new CRD.yaml, we can actually go and see that we have a custom resource definition here. This is how you create a custom resource definition. This is how you create a new endpoint on the API. You're gonna say, I wanna create a brand new endpoint called MySQL. Do you see how we're putting MySQL in here? It's probably pretty easy to guess what I'm trying to do. I want our users to be able to create a Kubernetes native object called MySQL, right? And when we do this, let's go ahead and create it. 
we notice that via the CLI, if we then run this command, and for those of you who don't know what OC is, OC is the client for OpenShift. It's really very comparable to kubectl, which is the client for Kubernetes that sends API calls to, for you. They're very, very similar. OC just happens to have some extra features for OpenShift, but they both do the same thing. They both send APIs, API calls to the Kubernetes API. And as you can see here, as we, when we do OC get CRD, this confirms that we've created the MySQL custom resource definition, okay? This really um, go, goes and creates the MySQL resource def, custom resource definition. Let's now actually go verify our new MySQL resource and object. We're gonna go ahead and say OC get MySQL. And after we do that, notice how it says no resources found. This is actually a good thing. This tells us that the API endpoint exists, but now we just have to create a MySQL object. For example, MySQL example or MySQL number one. So let's go ahead and create that object. So if we actually go and we say, okay, here's our new object. Notice that we now have the ability to specify the group that we originally created and the kind of MySQL. And we can put in a bunch of values, key values in our declaration. Now we haven't showed you what specific key values or where you would tell your user to put in here or what we would tell your user to put in here. But the reality is that the reality behind this is that you can actually create a man page, right? You can actually go and create a man page that will assist you using the explain command with what telling your users what to put inside here. And we can talk about that later. So let's go ahead and create this MySQL object. After we create the MySQL object and we say OC get MySQL, notice that now we have our WordPress object and we actually can output that in YAML and see that it's persisted on the API. So we now have an object on the API, but just so you know, nothing has actually been created in our Kubernetes environment yet because we don't have a controller. So it's just the fact that we've created something on the API. That right there is a custom resource. And a custom resource needs a controller to act upon its presence. So what does a Kubernetes controller do now that we have an object on the API? Well, that controller is going to sit there inside of our cluster, or just so you know, a controller can also run outside the cluster, and it's gonna look at the current state of the cluster. It's gonna watch the API and look for a MySQL declaration or any declaration that it chooses to watch. Once it receives an alert, AKA an event, that that actually has been created, okay? Actually, that has been created. Then what's gonna happen is we're gonna compare the current state to the desired state. So we're gonna go ahead and right in this class, we're gonna build an operator that looks at the current state of the cluster and compares that to the declaration, okay? After that, we're then gonna go ahead and act. We're gonna perform all the actions necessary to make the current state meet the desired state. And this controller gets triggered anytime there is an add, update, or, or I should say a create, update, and delete event on the things that we're watching. And that's a Kubernetes controller. We're gonna build one in here. We're gonna get the access to the slides and the learning environments right after this introduction. We're just gonna make sure we understand these concepts before we dive into that. So the replica sets in action. First of all, what we want to do is we wanna go ahead and um, we are going to, actually what I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna interrupt this real quick just to make sure we all have this. I know that some people may, may wanna be following along um, with the slides and so forth. So I just wanna provide this to you now. I'm just gonna interrupt this really quickly. If you open up your browser and Red Hatters that are in the room, feel free to share out this link. It's workshop.coreostrain.me, workshop.coreostrain.me. We'll give you the learning environments momentarily, but if you all wanna follow along with the slides, if you go to workshop.coreostrain.me, and you go to the support tab here, right? We have your, you have the slide here, slides here you can download, just so you know that content, or as you have to go somewhere right now, you have to run maybe, you can't make, you're trying to make another presentation, feel free to grab the slides there. Also, we have a copy of an ebook that was written by some Red Hatters here on Kubernetes operators. 
We also have a link to Operator Hub, which we'll show you momentarily, and some other links here. So I just wanted to make sure we had this link for you to download the content. So Red Hatters, feel free, that are in the chat, feel free to hand out that link, workshop.coreostrain.me. Thank you. So how does a replica set controller work? How does a replica set controller work? Well, a replica set controller, when you go and create the replica set, right, what does it do? Well, you say that you may want one replica. So then what it does is it goes and creates one pod, right? And notice that it uses labels to ensure that it's keeping track of the right pod, right? You're selecting on app equals my first app and the pod has app equals my first app. If we then go and we scale out our number of replicas to three, if we scale out our number of replicas to three, the replica set will then spin up two more pods because our controller sees that the declaration has changed. So the replica set is what we call the primary resource and the pods are the secondary resources. The pods are the secondary resources. So what are owner references? What are owner references? Well, owner references, when the replica set goes and creates something, it puts an owner reference on it. And the great thing about owner references is that owner references make it so when we go and we delete our replica set, the pods will also get deleted. And these are what we call our dependents or children. And the way it works is that if an owner reference, if it references the owner, in this case, the replica set, if that replica set goes away and gets deleted, guess what? the pod is not allowed to exist. So if the parent goes away, the child is not allowed to exist. And this is built into Kubernetes, built into Kubernetes. This is how we do garbage collection. You can imagine what it would be like if you had to delete the replica set and then go and find all the pods that control it and delete those. That would be really annoying, right? So how does the replica set control loop work? Well, once you create a replica set, the first thing the controller is going to do is find pods matching the label selector, right? And then it's going to compare the match versus desired count. And if there's too few pods, then what we're going to do is create additional pods from the current template. If there's too many pods, we're going to delete the excess number. And if there's just enough, then we're not going to do anything. It's going to be fine. Everything's going to level out. So check this out. We have a really nice visual for you seeing how exactly this is going to work. So your controller watches for two things. It's gonna watch for the replica set, for any time someone creates a replica set, and it's gonna watch for pods that are owned by that replica set. So it's watching for two things, the replica set and pods that are owned by the replica set. So right after someone creates a replica set, what happens? It kicks off an event. Once the event gets created, the replica set controller is going to get the current state and it's going to list all pods by the label specified here. At this case, we're going to have zero. We don't have any pods created yet, right? And zero is less than the declaration of three. So what is the pod logic, right? Or that, auto, that automated human knowledge going to ask for? It's going to say, create a pod, please. And after we create that pod, the very action of creating a pod that is owned by the replica set creates an event that the controller sees. Do you see this? Because the, the controller is always also watching for pods that are owned by the replica set. What then happens is it will then list pods by label. So it would be one at this point, less than the number of replicas. Yes, it is. We still don't have three. So then we create another pod, which creates another event, in which case we list all of ours. We have two is less than three. Then finally, once we have three meeting, once the actual state meets the declared state, we're happy. Do you see that? Check out this situation here. What about when we delete a pod? When we delete a pod, we then have two and we're gonna create another one. So controllers are always watching the API to ensure that the declared state in our object meets the actual state. Do you see that? So going back to our MySQL example, we need a controller. We need a controller because without a controller, everything is quiet in our cluster, right? We just have an object on the API. 
So we need a custom controller to notice the new database object and act and do something. But think about this. If only it were as simple as just creating or reading or updating or deleting a MySQL object, MySQL that you, as you all may know it, being a MySQL admin is very intense, right? There's a lot of things and tasks and activities that you need to do, do know to maintain that. A lot of operational knowledge. This is all the stuff that you're gonna have to build in to your operator because you don't wanna have to manually control it. You don't wanna have to have to any manual intervention. So to recap, custom resource definitions, custom controllers, and your knowledge equal operators, okay? And why do they matter? Why do operators matter? Because we're trying to build an as a service platform experience on Kubernetes. You want to build an ecosystem of software on Kubernetes that can be as easy and safe and reliable to use and operate as a cloud service. Low touch, remotely managed, one click updates. For example, for example, what we actually do here is we have, you can see from the dashboard, you can deploy the etcd operator or the prometheus operator or the vault operator, right? You can deploy these. And this will, you can easily install these operators, right, from the dashboard. And it kind of gives you that easy experience that you would experience on something like AWS or Azure or something like that. Um, and it's really easy to deploy an operator in a Kubernetes environment. So how do you create your own operator? Well, life before the operator SDK that is found in the operator framework, if only it were as simple as maybe defining some resources that you wanted to watch and then writing some like pseudo code here to get the current state and compare it to the desired state. It wasn't that easy because custom operators require many building blocks and blur play code. First of all, you have to go and research and download tools to interact with the API. These are the, AP, these are the client libraries. Maybe some of you have used these, but these are the ways of programmatically interacting with Kubernetes and Go, Python, or Java. You have to learn how these work first. Then you have to have knowledge of informers or shared informers for object cache and event handling. Why do you have to know about caching? Because think about this, if you're building a controller and that controller is watching the API and there's tons of controllers watching the API, we don't want to intensely tax the API and eat up its resources. So we have caching that our controllers do to make it less intense on the API server. Uh, you, you previously had to communicate desired state and actual state via annotations, track Kubernetes resources, test scaffolding and repo organization, so much stuff you had to do to build a custom controller. Just an example of a custom controller uh, that was built a while back um, using client Go, the Kubernetes uh, client library for Go. Uh, it's a lot of work. So that's why we needed an easier way to create operators and we need an easier way to manage them. And the operator framework which the operator SDK is found in is a great way of creating operators in a, in a really cool way. With operator SDK, you can build an operator with Golang, right? And we set up all the Go code for you. So all you have to do is write specifically your logic in Go. So all the surrounding code, boilerplate code is already there for you. For you. Ansible, so those of you who know and love Ansible, you can use your existing playbooks, existing modules, roles, collections, to actually go and create resources, not only within Kubernetes, but you can use those to create resources outside the cluster as well. And you're gonna learn that Ansible operator, when Michael talks about that with you, is powered by the Kubernetes modules for Ansible, which allow you to create tasks the way you know and love with Ansible that actually create resources in Kubernetes. Really cool stuff. And then also Helm. The Helm operator allows you to take all your existing Helm charts, if those of you are familiar with Helm, and convert those to operators as well. This is an example of the operator capability model. As you can see, if you convert an, an existing Helm chart to an operator, it takes you to basic install or seamless upgrade, both Ansible and Go. It will take you all the way to the ultimate operator autopilot, where you have horizontal, vertical auto scaling auto healing, abnormal detection, all of these great things that you can build into your operator. Also, there's the operator lifecycle manager. Operator lifecycle manager runs on any Kubernetes cluster, well, whether it's vanilla Kubernetes or it's OpenShift. It enables cluster admins to manage operators because as you all know, 
creating a custom resource definition, that's a pretty powerful privilege, right? You're modifying the API. With OLM, you may have a user who's only locked to a specific project or namespace, right? Because you don't want them having access to the entire cluster. A user who may just have limitations or may just have rights to a particular project or namespace will still have the ability to go and create an operator. So this is very, very powerful stuff. OLM handles that entire life cycle for you and allows a user who may not have cluster-wide privileges to actually go and install operators. We also have the operator hub.io. This is like an app store for operators. All these operators run on any vanilla Kubernetes. This has nothing to do with Red Hat or OpenShift in the context of being proprietary. This is upstream, it's community driven. It runs on any Kubernetes cluster. I recommend you all check it out. And if you're interested in getting your operator into the operator hub, please come talk to us. Uh, I will be in the virtual Red Hat booth after this presentation, and I'm happy to give you all the guidance you need to actually get your operator into the operator hub. So with that said, I want us all to go ahead and check out our learn, our training environments, because we're all gonna build an operator right now. We're gonna build an operator right now. We're gonna go to learn.openshift.com slash training. Learn.openshift.com slash training. After you go to learn.openshift.com slash training, you'll see a web page that looks like this. And what you wanna then go do is click on Operator SDK. And after you click on Operator SDK, you're gonna click on Operator SDK with Go. Now these modules, just so you know, these modules will be around uh, after the training and we're gonna give you a link to access them. So if you're having issues or for some reason it's not working because we are at capacity at 100 because we were originally we were just set up to have 100 support, 100 individuals here, 100 attendees. Um, don't worry, you will have access to these. But if you can, we're gonna do the operator SDK with Go. So you're gonna click on start scenario there. And then we're not gonna do this right this moment. I just wanna show you what the objective is. We're gonna talk about it but I just wanna make sure you all have access. You may have a situation where it says provisioning environment or creating environment. Just wait for that to complete. Melvin, Rose, and Michael, the Red Hatters in the chat, are happy to help you if you all are having issues. Okay, they're happy to help you with this. So we'll actually get started doing this in just a moment. I'm just gonna continue on a little bit here. So we have our workshop.coreostrain.me and we also have our um, learn.openshift.com slash training. And again, you can get your Kubernetes operator Red Hat certified and featured in the OpenShift operator hub or operatorhub.io today. Please come talk to us. I'll be in the virtual booth for Red Hat after this session, please come talk to me. I'm happy to get your operator into there so our users uh, can check it out. So um, what are we gonna do here? We're gonna build an operator. And this operator is called the Podset Operator Challenge. So let's go ahead and create a simple operator. Let's go ahead and create a simple operator. We're gonna call this operator a Podset. Now, first of all, we wanna let you know that when you go and create an operator, your operator is going to, when it goes and installs that application, right? It can, it's gonna create a lot of things. It may go and create a deployment. And then after it creates the deployment, it may go expose that deployment as a service, right? And then after it exposes that as a service, there may be config maps, there may be routes and ingresses that may get created. You can certainly do that. Why would you do that? Because the deployment in that case is a good fit for managing your pods. Think about the controllers you have built into Kubernetes. You have deployments, you have stateful sets, you have daemon sets. You have a variety of controllers to choose from, right, that you wanna create. If none of those are a good fit for your operator, then what you can do is go and create your own pod management logic if you want to. And that's what we're gonna do here. We're gonna create this thing called a pod set. And the pod set is going to actually not only is it going to watch for the creation of something called a pod set, 
it is also going to go and create its own pod maintenance logic. We're not going to rely on a replica set. We're not going to rely on a daemon set. We're not going to rely on a, on a deployment to manage our pods. We're going to build the logic into the controller. And so it's a simple controller that manages pods for us. As you can see here, the whole idea is that you're going to put in the number of pods that you want here. You're going to say that you want to have like, you know, four pods, five pods, whatever you want, and it will spin up that number of pods. And it will spin up that number of pods. After we actually go and spin up that number of pods, the names of the pods it currently manages will be in the pod name section and status. So that's what we want. Very, very simple. You don't have to put anything else inside here. If you change it to one, then the pod set will automatically go and scale down to one. So these are the requirements. The requirements are the replicas and the status. That's it. Replicas and pod names. That's it. Some hints before we actually do this are that, first of all, you identify what you want to watch. We're going to be watching for pod sets, and we're going to be watching for pods that are owned by the pod set. Those two things. We also have to make sure we set controller reference or owner references. Remember I told you about owner references and what they are? They're there to actually control what gets, uh, to control what gets cleaned up and what gets deleted. That's where owner references come in and we're gonna have a special function from the controller runtime library to allow that. And then of course we have to use labels to keep track of which pods we wanna manage. So let's go ahead and do this. I'm gonna go ahead and open up my environment here. Now, just so you know, after we actually go and create this, actually after we go and do a Go-based operator, Michael is gonna walk through creating an Ansible-based operator. So first we're going to build an operator with the operator SDK with Go. And then Michael is going to show you how you can build an operator with Ansible, right? So if you hang out after the Go-based one, maybe you all aren't Golang developers. This is a little too much for you. Just stick around and Michael will talk about building one with Ansible. So the first thing that we're going to do here in our exercises is we are going to go create a new project called My Project. Now we know that in the OpenShift world, a project is the same thing as a namespace, same thing. So then after doing that, we're gonna go and create a new directory in our Go path. Now what's the Go path for those of you that aren't gophers or not into the Go programming language? That's sort of our sandbox for our Go projects that we build, right? For our Go programs. After we're inside there, we're going to go to this Red Hat directory and we're gonna look how simple this command is to create an operator. Operator dash SDK, new pod set dash operator, dash dash type equals go. Look how easy that is, right? Now, if you wanted to build an Ansible one, all you'd have to do is dash dash type equals Ansible. And what's happening right now is it's going and creating all the boilerplate code. Notice how you haven't told it what kind of operator you wanna create. You haven't told it what you want your custom resource definition to be. You haven't given any of that information. This is just the default boilerplate code. And if you all are wondering, what is really happening here while waiting for this? What's going on behind the scenes? What's going on is these are all your packages, your dependencies that are being imported into your Go code. This is going out to the net and grabbing all those packages for you, okay? So this is using DEP for dependency management, for our dependency management for our packages that we may depend on in our code. Okay, so now that we have our boilerplate code, we're going to drop in to our directory. Let's go ahead and CD into the pod set operator directory. Now, if I do ls inside that directory, notice that I have uh, some default code here. And I'm sorry, we're not using dep, we're using go modules. We're using go modules. We're okay, so what we're doing here is with our mod files here, this is a way for us to actually tie a Go package to a specific branch or version, right? So we can actually ensure we're getting the right version of that dependency. Also, you here have a deploy directory. It's going to have some manifests into it. So this is just our boilerplate code for right now. If we go into step two, so everyone, we are on step two of seven on our exercise here. Here comes the very, very powerful command. After we've created our boilerplate code, we are now going to tell our operator something. We're going to tell our operator, please create this custom resource definition. 
And we do that via the add API command. We say operator SDK, add API, dash dash API version, and we put in the version here, app.example.com slash v1 alpha one, dash dash pod set. So this is where we're getting customizable, right? We're saying we want this to be our group version and we want this to be our kind. So go ahead and run that command so we can see what happens. So as you can see, it's creating these Go files for us automatically, specifically one that we're gonna look at is called the types.go. We'll look at that in just a moment. But for right now, what you need to understand is that it's taking this information that we've given it and creating all the code that will reference the fact that we want a custom resource definition with these parameters. Again, we have not provided any other information to our operator. We haven't told it what it's gonna do, how it's going to act, any other information in the CRD, this is it. So now that we've created this, notice how it gives us a CRD automatically. Do you see our custom resource definition? It automatically created this for us based off the information we provided. I'll tell you right now, that there's a whole bunch of really cool validation information that we can put inside here. And we'll show you an easy way we can do that. But for right now, this is pretty generic, but it's something, right? It's, it's something. So let's go ahead and click continue and go to step three. Now, the first step that we're going to have to go ahead and do is update our types.go file. Now, what the types.go file is, is an opportunity for us, the operator authors, to talk about what we want users to put inside the spec, right? And what we want in the status. And the reason why we're doing this is because we need to create a predictable schema. What do I mean by that? We need to create a predictable schema. What I mean is that if our code is going to be creating human operational knowledge and look at the declaration of the spec and status that users are gonna create. If we're gonna grab data and values from this declaration, we need a predictable schema to interact with those values within our code. Well, how do we do that? How do we do that? We do that by first customizing our types.go file. So as you can see, what we're going to do, and by the way, you don't have to copy and paste any of this stuff in, we can actually go and run this command right here and it will automatically update the file. How easy is that? If only coding were that easy, right? Well, that wouldn't be very fun if coding was like that in the real world. But here's the idea, right? Here's the idea. Um, the idea here is that you are going to go and notice that we're setting in the spec section. We're doing a struct, first of all. What's a struct? It's a custom type in Go a custom type that we're creating, we're inventing this. We're gonna say, we want a replicas field that's a 32-bit integer, and this right here, this JSON tag is gonna do the marshalling and demarshalling of the JSON that the user creates, or YAML, right? Which is the superset of JSON. And we're gonna say, look in the replica section, and then when you grab the number, let's say three, put that as that value so we can manipulate it in our code. Look at the status section here. Remember we told you you had to have pod names? Let's go ahead and make sure that that's an array of strings and that we get those values and can publish to those values based off the pod names within the actual object, right? So then after we do that, we then create or run the generate k command. And many of you may be thinking, what is this generate k command? The generate k command runs the deep copy code generators that ensure that you can reference these, these values and these keys and fields in your code. After doing that, we then, this is a really, really awesome command. Look at this command, generate CRDs. When you run this command, generate CRDs, it is smart enough to go look at your types.go file and notice that you had these particular values in there. And it says, okay, we're gonna go ahead and we're going to create a CRD that tells you that replicas is required. You see that? So validation will start occurring on the API level. This is really, really handy for just adding that API validation so that users can't put in bad values into their declarations. And then what we wanna do is create our CRD in our cluster because an operator cannot start unless a CRD is running. 
our CRD is available. In other words, an operator cannot watch an API endpoint that doesn't, have, that doesn't exist. So we wanna make sure that the pod set operator endpoint exists. Okay, after doing that, we're gonna go ahead and make sure the CRD is available and it is, we see the CRD there, right? And then after doing that, we're gonna go ahead and add the new controller. Now, what is adding the new controller? We don't have a controller yet, right? So at this point, there'd be nothing to manipulate our, our uh, declaration. So how do we add a controller to our project? You just run the add controller command. And what this tells our code is it says, please create some boilerplate logic, right? Some boilerplate logic to manipulate your code. But we don't want boilerplate logic. We want to customize our very own controller to actually go and create a pod set. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to copy. What I want you to do is scroll down here, and I want you to just click this button so we make sure it gets updated. That's going to update your code. And I'm going to talk about this code briefly, and then we're going to run our pod set. So I'm going to take this uh, here, this logic, and I'm just going to go ahead and open it up in Microsoft Code so that we, my IDE, so that we can get a better idea of uh, what it looks like here. Yeah, we'll open a new window to make it more clear. Okay, so let's talk about what's actually happening here. What's actually happening inside of our, um, our uh, project here. So first of all, the first thing to pay attention to, and look, I do realize we're very short on, we only have an hour and a half here, so we're gonna be going through this quickly, but again, all the resources will be presented to you and we'll be here after to answer any questions. The first thing we're gonna watch for are pod sets, right? Because pod set is the primary resource. So we're gonna watch for pod sets. And we're also gonna watch for um, po uh, pods that are owned by a pod set. So we care about two things. We care about watching for the creation, update, and delete of a pod set, and the creation, delete, and update of a pod that is owned by a pod set. After that gets, if one of these gets created, somebody creates a pod set, for example, it triggers what's known as the reconciler. The first thing the reconciler does is it gets a copy using the client. And you may be wondering, what's the client do? The client just sends RESTful API calls to the Kubernetes API. It's gonna get a fresh copy of the declaration. What's the declaration have in it? It has the number of replicas that I want. After getting a fresh copy of that, what it's going to see is that we want three replicas, let's say, for example. And then it's our chance to get the actual state of the environment by listing all pods owned by the pod set instance. We're gonna go ahead and list all pods owned by the pod set instance. How do we do that? Well, it's really easy. We're just gonna do that by ensuring that we look for pods that meet this criteria, that have this label, the name of the pod set with this version, right? And we're just gonna run a list. For those of you who use Kubernetes day in and day out, running this function here, this method, is the same thing as doing an OC get pods with a filter on it, right? We're passing list options that enables us to filter based off the labels. After we get the number of pods, we can range and go, ranging is just looping over this list of pods that come back, and we're going to only count the pods that are in pod running and pod pending. We don't want to count pods that are being deleted because those are being deleted, right? If they have a deletion timestamp not equal to nil, we don't count those, they don't count because they're not really owned by us, they're going away, they're going bye-bye, right? So we're gonna do a count on the number of pods using length, and while we're at it, we're gonna grab their names, just so we can actually use that for the status. So we're gonna range over their names. We're then gonna use the deep equal package, which does comparisons, to compare the status in my declaration to the actual names, right? And what we'll do is this will automatically send a status update to get the pod names into the object. And of course, here comes the most important part of all comparing the current number of pods to the declaration. This is our comparison to the actual state of the cluster, which is here, to our declared state. And if the number available is greater than the number in the replicas, we're gonna scale down. But the more likely scenario is that the number available is gonna be less than, right? The declaration, we're gonna go ahead and scale up. Do you see that? And what's it gonna do when it scales up? 
it's gonna create a brand new pod. Notice it's just a busy box pod, but notice this right here, generate name. Generate name ensures that every time it creates a pod, it will actually put a unique hash at the end. That unique hash makes it so we can create multiple pods in the same namespace. Because I know that all you Kubernetes experts out there know that you can't have multiple pods with the same name inside one namespace. So generate name will actually ensure that it puts a unique hash at the end. Maybe some of you have actually seen this before. So with that said, let's go ahead and create this thing. What we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and click on continue. And then we're gonna go ahead and run the operator inside. Okay, I'm not sure at what point I went, I muted. I think we lost you just about 10 seconds ago. We got, okay. Accident. Okay, cool. Okay. All right. So, um, what I'm doing here, what I'm doing here is I am running the controller within the cluster. I am running the control. I am running the controller within. Actually, I'm excuse, excuse me, excuse me. I'm running my controller outside the cluster using the operator SDK run dash dash local command. It's using my kube config in my home directory, and it's watching the my project command and uh, or watching the my project namespace. And it's, it's waiting for the creation of my kind pod set. So this is a great command to run if you're doing development. Let's imagine you have to go and make a code change. All you have to do is run this command. It will compile. This is kind of like doing like a go run CMD. Those of you that are gophers out there, right? You're just compiling, the, creating the command and running it real quick, right? Just to test your code. So what are we waiting for here as it spins up? We're waiting for the creation of the kind pod set. Let's go ahead and create it. We're gonna open up a new terminal. And then what we're gonna do inside of our new terminal is make sure that our custom resource has replica set. So if you click that, it will make sure it has three set for the replicas. And then here comes the moment of truth. I'm gonna create my custom resource and I should see my reconciler and my controller get kicked off. Okay, actually let me make sure I'm on the, uh, in the right spot here, give me one sec. There we go. Hey Matt, a quick question. Uh, so this previous one uh, operator that is uh, a run within the cluster only, right? I mean, I see it's within a namespace my project. Yes, this this is running outside. This is running outside the cluster. We happen to be inside of a cluster here. We know the typical way that you would run a controller, the more formal way, if you will, the way you would do it in production, is by actually compiling and building an image, right? And putting that image into like something like a deployment and putting that into your cluster. And Operator SDK features all of the tools to actually do that for you. But we're in a, we're, you know, we're trying to just kind of show you in this environment how quick it is to just run the controller outside of the cluster. But typically in production, you would run it inside. Does that make sense? No, but I'm still confused. I see here it is specifying uh, hyphen hyphen namespace my project. So I assume it is within the namespace, which is within the cluster. Uh, how is it outside the cluster? Because you know when you use the kubectl command line, are you familiar with kubectl? When you use kubectl, yeah, yeah, yeah. right. So when you use kubectl and you say OC get pods, right? We know that you're probably typically scoped to a particular namespace or you can pass a namespace flag. So this is no different than kind of running the kubectl outside the cluster. So in this case, so whether you're running a controller outside the cluster or inside the cluster, you're still hitting the API, right? As long as that API endpoint is externally accessible. Okay, got it, okay. Just the local binary it is running on the local. Yes, this is just, this is just a command that is used for development purposes to ensure that you can quickly, it's just for, it's not something you would do in production. It's just for development. So you, if you're trying to test your code, you want to just compile your binary and have it point to an API endpoint that you can watch and ensure that your logic works. Okay. Thank you. Sure. 
no problem. So now that we've created the custom resource, now that we've created the custom resource, notice that our controller reconciler was kicked off. So now if we actually go and do OC get pod set, we can see that we have a pod set. And if we say OC get pod set, example pod set dash o yaml notice how we have three and this has the pod names we currently own let's make sure those pods are there yes they are let's make sure those pods have an owner references on them yes they do right yes they do have owner references on them right there right so if i delete my pod set it should go away what we're going to go ahead and do is we're just going to go ahead and in this case here, we're going to go and let me just make sure. Let's go ahead and do this. Let's go ahead and change the number of pods to five and see if my pod set responds accordingly. Yes, it does. My pod set is now spinning up five pods. If I look at my controller, I can see that my controller is reacting to those changes. Do you see that? Now, if I actually go and delete my pod set completely, uh, my expectation is that the pod set should delete the pods as well. Let's go ahead and try it. Yep. Notice that by just deleting the pod set, it also deletes the pods because the pods have owner references on them and the pods are not allowed to exist if their owner doesn't exist. And at this point, the example pod set owner does not exist. So the pods are going away. Okay. So um, I know that was very, very quick and we want to, we definitely want to answer your questions, but we ask that you put your questions in the chat and we will happy to assist you. Also, we'll be in the virtual booth after this presentation. I'm now going to go ahead and hand it over to Michael, who will now show you how easy it is to build an operator with Ansible. Hey everyone. Stand by just a moment. I'll get the right screen shared. All right. If anybody if you can't see my slides, somebody shout at me. Let's get rolling. Uh, we're going to talk about Ansible, and we're going to make an operator using Ansible and see how good a fit Ansible really is for automating Kubernetes in general uh, and for creating an operator. It's a really, really wonderful way with a lot of uh, particular advantages I think you're going to like. So let's look at the Ansible K8S module first, just to get a taste quickly of, of what this looks like and how this is a, a good fit. So on the left, we see just normal YAML that you would use when interacting with Kubernetes. This is defining a config map. So this is the kind of text, of course, those of you familiar with, with interacting with Kubernetes from the command line, perhaps, you might have that text in a YAML text file and run kubectl create-f that file or apply it, and now that resource gets created in Kubernetes. Well, on the right, you see we're doing exactly the same thing, but we're using Ansible to do this. And of course, in Ansible, uh, Ansible is also very YAML-based, just like Kubernetes tends to be. And in Ansible, we put together a series of these kind of tasks where we declare what we want. So classically, um, in Ansible, uh, some Ansible code might start with we're going to install some RPMs or install some Debian packages and like that. We're going to configure a firewall, um, these kinds of things. So here, this particular Ansible task is using that K8S module in it. We have a definition that we're just inlining a definition for this config map. And you can see the YAML from the left side to the right, exactly the same. The only difference that, that I did put in here just to kind of show off the feature is templatizing this color value. So instead of just hard coding that is red, we now are using the templating features of Ansible to make that something we can inject at the time that we run Ansible based on whatever variables uh, we, we specify when running Ansible. So this is a really easy way. You can take your existing Kubernetes YAML and inline it into an Ansible task like this and immediately now Ansible becomes a Kubernetes client for you. You can use Ansible to now, every time you run this Ansible task, it will ensure that that config map exists 
and it will ensure that it exists in the state that you've specified here. So it's pretty cool. It makes it very easy to interact with Kubernetes resources. And you can already see that this that Ansible itself is fairly declarative, just like Kubernetes is declarative. In Ansible, we want to declare what state we want to end up with, and we can keep running Ansible again and again. And it will always ensure that, that after it runs, no matter what your starting state was, you end up in the correct ending state. I'm sure that sounds familiar after listening to Matt describe how controllers work. Now, what if you don't want to inline your YAML in that way? Well, we've got an even better option for you here with the K8S module. You can keep your Kubernetes YAML in a template file uh, and reference it in just this one liner here. So here we're, we're using the Ansible lookup feature. This is a normal feature of Ansible that those of you who, I know I saw we have a number of Ansible users attending here from uh, our, our little survey at the beginning. So the lookup feature here can look up your Kubernetes template and utilize whatever variables you have at runtime that you've provided to, to Ansible or that it's using uh, or looking up or deriving at runtime. And it will use all that information to render your template and then apply the result to your cluster. So let's just imagine for a moment, you already have a big YAML file. Uh, it's just a big Kubernetes manifest and you have figured out how to deploy something, whatever your application is. So you've got deployments and services and secrets and config maps and uh, maybe pod disruption budgets and all the, all the kind of things that you want when you're deploying a workload on Kubernetes. You can take that and just save it as a template, start templatizing values and reference it from this three lines of Ansible code. And now you can use Ansible as your client to continuously apply uh, the, that manifest to your cluster. And of course, in a minute, we're going to see how to turn that into a controller. Now let's talk about an Ansible role for a moment. If you're not familiar with the concept of a role, this is an, a core Ansible concept that, again, going back to the classic, like traditional operational use of Ansible, you might have a role that's something like web server. So you would make a role for your environment, for your corporation or your organization, wherever you're, you're operating, that would install your favorite web server, configure it the way you want, maybe get your TLS certificate, uh, rotation set up, that kind of stuff, whatever your standard web server uh, should look like. And you can apply that role to different machines, right? So roles are I don't know, a little bit like roles in a play. Uh, you know, one person has one role, a different actor has another role. Well, here we're grouping Ansible code that's related to accomplish a certain thing like turn a host into a web server, or in our case, uh, deploy a Kubernetes workload onto a cluster. So a role is a way to group that stuff together. And this is the basic layout of what a role looks like. Now, this role is going to get templatized for you. It's all going to get scaffolded out, so you don't have to make this by hand. Um, so you're going to see this after it gets created for you. And these two things highlighted in yellow are the, really the only parts that you need to be familiar with to get started and really go a long way. So the first one is under our tasks directory, this main.yaml. So main.yaml is where you enlist each of your tasks, just like we were looking at a moment ago. So just going back a slide, here's a task that we would put. It could be one of many tasks into our main.yaml file. And then templates, that's a directory where you'll just drop in whatever template files you care to reference from your tasks. And it's really that easy. Ansible Galaxy, I'll just mention, is essentially a global repository of Ansible roles that, that people have created and shared and that you can then reuse. And in fact, we're going to use one in just a moment when we get into the workshop exercise part of this. So why would you use Ansible with Kubernetes? Well, we have very similar patterns here, right? We have YAML on both sides, and we, it's very declarative on both sides, and idempotent on both sides. So on a controller in Kubernetes, we want to be able to 
to say that no matter what the starting state is, we have declared what we want and a controller will get you what you want regardless of where you're starting. Ansible is just the same way. So these are a really good fit. Now we have a lot of ops teams that are already familiar with Ansible. In fact, based on the questions that Matt asked at the beginning of this workshop, uh, these res results are very typical of the results we find when we ask groups these questions. Typically, we have a lot of Kubernetes users who already know Ansible, who are familiar with Ansible, and even using Ansible for other things unrelated to Kubernetes. And it's a very easy and simple transition to begin using that tooling and that existing knowledge and expertise to manage Kubernetes workloads and Kubernetes itself. Um, Ansible is real easy to learn, so even if you're not familiar with it already, it's, it's real simple, especially what you see today. Uh, it uses Jinja templating. I'm sure you're already familiar with that. Even if you're not familiar with it by name, I'm sure you've encountered it and utilized it at some point. And, uh, and Ansible is fully capable of, of day two management. Uh, you can build a completely capable advanced operator or controller using Ansible. What we're going to look at today is very basic. We're just going to scratch the surface and try to give you a taste of what's possible and how you can get started on your own. But you can really go very deep with Ansible. It's, it's very fully featured, both on cluster and off cluster. And yeah, that's one last point I'll, I'll raise before we move on. Ansible has this huge ecosystem of existing capabilities to interact with um, services, with software, with databases, storage, with all kinds of appliances. It can interact with cloud environments. It can interact with hardware. You can use Ansible to reconfigure networking hardware, all this kind of stuff already is baked in Ansible. And you can access all of that functionality from a Kubernetes operator now by using Ansible inside your, your operator to implement your operator logic. So let's look at the operator side of this real quick. Now, just recapping what you've already learned and what we already know, the basic workflow of how a controller works, right? is we've got the smiling little client up here talking to the Kubernetes API and creates a custom resource. And in there, they specify what state do they want their application to be in. And we have this controller that is watching for events. It's continuously watching for events to happen in the API service related to the, the resource that, that it's watching. And when it receives that event, it runs that reconcile function it runs some kind of reconciliation logic that evaluates the current state, evaluates what your declared state is, what's the difference between the two, and makes changes to move the current state closer to your desired state. And of course, in the operator pattern, our goal is to, is to deploy and manage some kind of workload. So your application gets deployed and gets spat out the other side. So how does this work in the Ansible world? Well, this controller in the middle, uh, we have implemented an operator for you already that is part of the operator SDK. It is this generic Ansible operator. Now, we implemented it in Go. We utilize the operator SDK to do it. And it basically handles all the logistics for you of watching the API for events and when it sees an event that your operator cares about, so you tell it uh, which resources you're going to want to be watching. When it sees an event, its job is to go find the correct Ansible role or Ansible playbook and run that role or playbook. And it'll run it injecting all the information from your custom resource into Ansible as variables at runtime. So when you're rendering those templates and doing other kinds of logic in Ansible, it has access to everything that was in that custom resource and can utilize that uh, in its reconciled logic. Now we have this interesting watch file in the middle. We're going to look at an example of this in just a moment. That's really just a mapping that tells this binary, this Ansible operator binary, when an event comes in for a particular resource, what, uh, what role or playbook corresponds to that resource. Uh, and that's how the operator knows I'm going to go load this role and I'm going to run that role with this input. 
Now, digging just a little bit deeper into a couple of the features here, there's some kind of interesting stuff going on. Uh, the proxy on the right side is one of the more interesting parts of this and has enabled us to provide some very handy features. So when, when you run Ansible in this context, we're, we're using what's called the Ansible Runner. Now, the Ansible Runner was a part of the Ansible Tower project originally. It's just a programmatic vehicle, basically, for running Ansible in a programmatic way instead of in a, a human command line kind of way. Uh, Ansible Runner emits events that this uh, Ansible operator binary watches for. All this is, is basic implementation details you don't have to worry about. But Ansible Runner, when we run Ansible, we set up a Kubernetes API proxy so that it talks directly to this proxy. Uh, and that proxy enables us to do some interesting things. The proxy one enables us to provide a cache. So we can have a long running cache uh, that is interacting with the Kubernetes API. I think Matt mentioned the cache, and we know that the cache is a very important part of a controller. There, on any given Kubernetes clusters, uh, there are so many controllers running all the time. If they weren't doing fairly aggressive caching of, of what they're watching, we could easily overwhelm the Kubernetes API service running on that controller at any given time. So we're running this cache for you outside of Ansible that Ansible is able to take advantage of just seamlessly, transparently even. We're also able to do some things like intelligently watch what resources is your Ansible code creating? And then based on seeing what resources your, your Ansible code creates, we will automatically watch those additional resources as uh, secondary resources for you. Really neat stuff. Uh, and there are some other features that come along with that, but those are a couple of the highlights. And let's see, with that, well, let's just keep moving on. Okay, here's the example of that watches file. Now, we have uh, here an example, a memcached resource type. And this is the example that we're going to go through in our exercise in just a couple minutes. Uh, memcached, so what this says is every time you see an event for this memcached resource, run the playbook at this path on disk. And that's it. And we could have many different entries in this watches file for as many different resources as we want to, to be able to watch and have a controller for. There are lots of other features you can implement here. For example, we support finalizers, um, some other kinds of advanced stuff that probably don't have time to go into right now. But this is the basics. You don't have to really touch this, you'll see that this gets scaffolded out for you automatically, but it's, it's worth just knowing and understanding how this part of, of your Ansible-based controller works. As we saw earlier, with both Ansible and Go, you can create very feature-rich controllers and operators and do everything you need. In fact, uh, as an exercise, I've implemented the pod set operator that we looked at uh, with Matt. I implemented that in Ansible very straightforward to do. Uh, Ansible is at, uh, at the same time very, very simple to use. And if you, if you want a simple controller, it's very easy to do. But you can also then, when you want to, when you're ready to, you can go very deep in terms of functionality. Um, OK, quickly here, in the spec part of your custom resource, whatever you specify you want your state to be, all those key value pairs you put in your spec get directly injected into Ansible as variables at runtime. So we looked at that example at the beginning. Color was, was one that I put in uh, that template. So we could, in our spec for a resource, say color and say red as the value. And then that key and value pair will be available inside Ansible at runtime uh, for your templates and any other logic to utilize. So it's a really easy pipeline here directly from the Kubernetes API all the way into your Ansible code, all taken care of for you, and you can just write your templates or write your Ansible logic and not have to worry about it. Status, I'm not going to get into that too deep, but suffice it to say, we auto-generate a reasonable, fairly generic status for you as part of the Ansible operator, but then if you prefer to have a, a custom status, make your own status, you can absolutely do that as well. And here's the experience. We're going to get into this and see this in action in just a moment. You can run the operators to K command. You say type equals Ansible here. 
and it will automatically scaffold out an Ansible role. It will create that mapping file for you, the watches.yaml. It will make your custom resource definition and make a deployment manifest so you can actually deploy your new operator. And if you want to learn more about this after we're done with this workshop, of course, you can go to ansible.com slash operators anytime and find a bunch more information there. And with that, let's go into our workshop. Okay, here we go. Uh, let me back out of here. So we're going to go to the Ansible Operator Overview exercise. See if this thing will cooperate with me. Okay, so we're at the Ansible Operator Overview exercise. Um, now, luckily, I'm going to fast forward you guys through a lot of this content. You'll see there are eight steps as part of this. Well, I have good news. The first, let's say, four and a half steps are basically just learning material. Uh, I know it's, it's valuable learning material. I, I don't want to downplay that part. But thankfully, it's stuff we've already mostly gone over uh, in this talk so far. So I would recommend come back, read through it. Uh, a second pass through this content is definitely going to help you really understand this better and cement your knowledge of what you're picking up here. Again, with this workshop, really we're, we're aiming to give you a taste of what's possible and enable you to come back and, and dig deeper later. But for now, we're on step five. We're scrolling about halfway down, and we're ready to run this operator SEK new command. So we're going to run that. And boom, just scaffolded out all the things we just talked about. So let's run this tree command and see what we have. OK. Uh, in the build directory, we have a Docker file for actually building our, our operator. We have the ability to do all these manifests related to deploying the operator, standard stuff that you get uh, when you want to deploy a Kubernetes operator. Molecule, this is an interesting testing uh, set of tooling specific to Ansible that as it turns out, is very useful even for testing non-Ansible-based operators and controllers. Not going to go into that today, but definitely recommend if you're interested in testing uh, and how to do some pretty effective testing, check that out. And now here's our role. So we had a memcached role get scaffolded out for us. We have the things that we recognize. We have main.yaml in our task directory. Remember we talked about that. And we have a templates directory. Now our goal here with this operator is we're going to deploy memcached. And we're going to make uh, an operator that's going to deploy that workload for us. So of course, we have a custom resource called memcached to represent what is our desired state for that memcached deployment. Now, let's change directories into our memcached operator that we just created and continue on to step six. Time to customize some logic. Now, rather than opening up that main.yaml file and typing in some stuff or pasting in some stuff, we're going to utilize Ansible Galaxy. And one of our colleagues, Dylan, who also worked on the, uh, on the operator framework, created this role for us that we're going to reuse. So Ansible Galaxy is a tool you can use to actually just download and install an Ansible role. So there we go. I just clicked on that. It got that role for us. We can just check out. What we have in there. Yep. Okay. Now we see two roles in here, and we want to get rid of that that one that we're not going to actually use. So let's click on RM, cleaned that up. Now let's take a little closer look at what Dylan gave us. Again, familiar things. Uh, he's not using a templates directory, but we do have a tasks file here. And in fact, we can take a quick look in there. Stand by. I'm going to try to make this civilized for us. Oh, gosh. There's more here than I saw the other day. OK, fine. Um, there we go. That's, that's at least a little more readable. So we can see here what Dylan did is he inlined his definition. So we're using the K8S module, right? And uh, we have a deployment that he's defined here. And he's templatized a few values. 
So that custom resource that we're going to create in, in just a few minutes is available in here under the, the variable name meta. So meta.name is the name of your custom resource that's being reconciled. Meta.namespace, well, that's the namespace uh, of that custom resource. And size is just uh, an attribute of the spec. That's something we're going to specify in the spec of our custom resource. So that's what we have going on here in this Ansible uh, role. Now we can look in, in the defaults file, and we see we've defaulted a size of one. So we've specified a, a default value for the size. Now we've already looked at this stuff, so let's just keep going. Now because we changed the path for where our role exists, we need to fix our watches file. Now we've got this handy link here you can do to, to w get that. Um, and you know I'm just going to take the easy and lazy route right now and do that. Otherwise, we could open up you know, watch, the watches.yaml file and just fix it by hand. But that nice little link just kind of took care of it for us. OK, now let's continue on. And let's actually create our custom resource. So we need to tell Kubernetes about our custom resource definition. Again, it got scaffolded for us by the operators decay. So that part is ready to go. We're just going to click here. And now, and this is one of the most amazing things I think about Kubernetes, we just added an entire resource endpoint to the Kubernetes API uh, and you know, unlocked this whole set of features and capabilities around that for watching those resources, getting events, reconciling, and all that stuff is now enabled. And we have a couple of ways, uh, kind of following on the discussion that, that one of you is having with Matt, a little bit ago, we can run an Ansible base operator, just like a Go base operator, either locally, just on your laptop for development purposes, or of course, build it into a container image and run that container image in a pod inside your cluster. Now, I'm a, I'm a software engineer. I hack on operators you know, all day, every day. So I'm typically running these operators on my laptop. And I want very quick feedback. So if something doesn't work like I expected, I want to kill it. I'm going to make a couple changes to my code and immediately rerun it. I don't want to wait for a container image to build and then push that image to the right place and then wait for the cluster to pull the image. And That's all just too much time. So that's why what we're going to show you right now is how to run this thing locally uh, so you can get quick iteration in your development cycle. So we're going to run this thing. Uh, because we're running it locally, instead of inside of a container image, uh, we need to put our roles in the correct place. Because if we re remember from the watches YAML file, it's expecting that inside your container image that your role is going to be available at this path in the file system inside your container image. Well, when I run this thing on my laptop, there's nothing there. I don't put those roles in, in that path on my laptop. But what we're going to do in this environment is we are, in fact, going to copy what we have to that path in our local environment. And now we're ready for the big moment where we actually run this thing. Uh, so let's just skip down here to we're making a new project, which is based in namespace. Uh, OpenShift has put some additional features around namespaces. Uh, but suffice it to say, that's what a project is. We just created one. And now we're going to do a very similar uh, run command here. And immediately it's running because we've already got the binary. There's no compiling to do. Uh, it's already running. It's already watching things. We see the normal kind of log statements we would expect. And now, OK, here's an important part to not miss. In a second terminal window, so we're going to hit this plus button here. And that enables us to open a new terminal window. OK. So now we can, we can just click these tabs to go back and forth. So we've got our, operating, our operator running in one of them. Now in this one, we're going to change directories into where we're working. And we're going to create a custom resource. So there's already an example custom resource scaffolded out for you. Um, we are just going to create it. We can look at it real quick.
Uh, we see it's got a size of three, and otherwise, and this is just a totally normal Kubernetes custom resource, right? And in the spec, we can put any key value pairs here we want, and all of those will get injected into Ansible and used to render things and, and have other logic. So let's go and create that thing. That's created. And let's run OC get deployment. And we see no resources found. OK. Why is that? I don't know. There it is. OK. Maybe I'm not in the right namespace. Or there it is. It just took it a moment to run. Fantastic. So we see some output here. We see some Ansible output. It took it a moment for Ansible uh, to wake up. We see normal Ansible output here. So our controller ran that Ansible code, created that deployment. We already have three out of three uh, pods up and running. And now, if we want to change our size here, so the exercise says we can change it to four. Well, let's go ahead and uh, I don't know, let's change it to five. So I'm going to save that. And now we're going to skip down here and apply that change. OK. So we applied the change. We're going to wait. OK. We see three out of five are ready. We can get pods. You can see some are creating. So there you go. That's basically uh, what we have. We now, we, we now, just by taking an existing Kubernetes manifest, templatizing it a little bit and putting it into this scaffolded project for you, you now have a controller and an operator, which not only gives you this way to continuously reconcile your workflows and your resources, it gives you a way to manage your Kubernetes resources from the Kubernetes API. This is what Kubernetes native is really all about. You have a Kubernetes API endpoint called memcached you can use it to now manage and continuously reconcile the, your desired state. And you now have access to the whole operator ecosystem. So everything around operator lifecycle manager um, and all the, the, the power of that kind of management, that whole dogma of management of Kubernetes workloads and Kubernetes clusters and infrastructure even themselves, all of that is available to you now through Ansible um, based on just this little bit of work that we did. So that's the overview here. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this and see some value in this. I would encourage you to go back and do some of the other exercises in, uh, that are available for the operator framework. Um, and with that, Matt, I'll hand it back over to you. Cool, thank you. So what I'd like to do is just kind of give you all an idea of how and I'm going to share my screen out in just a moment. Um, I want to give you an idea of what the experience is like um, using and installing an operator on the dashboard with the operator lifecycle manager. So hold on one second here while I get my environment up for you. Give me one moment. Okay. Okay, one moment here. Okay, so you all should be able to see that properly. Um, <clears throat> what you're looking at here is the OpenShift dashboard, which this is for um, OpenShift 4. And you all can check out OpenShift 4 at try.openshift.com. Try.openshift.com. If you go there, this will automatically show you how easy it is to get started creating an OpenShift 4 cluster directly on AWS, Azure, GCP, or even bare metal. And once, what you have to realize is that OpenShift 4 is completely powered by operators. 
the entire infrastructure is powered by operators. And as Michael was saying, it's even Kubernetes native on the infrastructure level. What do we mean by that? We mean that literally if you were to example, deploy a cluster on um, a um, AWS environment, the actual AWS instances, right, that are running Red Hat Core OS, which is a immutable operating system uh, from Red Hat, uh, those objects are Kubernetes native. So you can think about when, for example, you exceed capacity in the cluster, or when you perhaps have to um, create pods and they're pending because you don't have enough capacity, it will automatically send Kubernetes API calls, which will create new objects that represent the underlying AWS instances, which then in turn send AWS API calls to spin up new instances. So it's completely Kubernetes native all the way down. Uh, what we're going to show you here is what the operator experience is like. If you want to go ahead and certify an operator and get it into uh, Operator Hub, what that would be like for you. So what I'm doing here is I am just getting my credentials on the command line, and I am going to log into the OpenShift 4 dashboard. Okay. So now that I'm logged in here, what can I can actually see is on this left panel, I have all my various categories for all my Kubernetes resources. And now we have this operators tab. With this operators tab, it actually allows us to browse the operator hub. This is a place where all of our uh, partners and customers can actually publish their operators. There's a variety of operators in here, everything from API brokers, to databases, to things for networking like service mesh, a lot of great stuff in here. And uh, for example, let me go ahead and let me show you what the experience is to install Argo CD. For those of you who have never used Argo CD, here's the reality, you all should check this out because we all know that in the real world, users do not typically go and install, first of all, they don't go and install operators manually. That doesn't happen. Also, I mean, with that said, it's in the same vein as we don't go and do kubectl apply manually, right? We know that in production scenarios, it's not like, okay, it's time to roll out the app and everyone starts you know, getting on the command line running kubectl apply. What you typically have are your Kubernetes objects that are checked into some sort of version control, right? And within that version control system, you have that connected to a cluster and you have times in which some kind of trigger or some kind of hook kicks off the application of those manifests into your environment. Argo CD is a great way to do that. It provides our GitOps piece to the puzzle for continuous delivery, right? To get our Kubernetes objects into our cluster. Argo CD operator was created and started by some members of our uh, team here in the operator enablement team at Red Hat. And uh, it's a great example to kind of show you um, installing an operator and what that experience is like. Notice here how you have the install button. So if I'm a regular user and I'm locked to a particular project or namespace, I can easily go and deploy this operator. Just like Michael shows you with like, you know, creating the CRDs and we showed you with the go operator, that doesn't happen here. We don't manually go and do that. It happens for us automatically. And OLM, the operator lifecycle manager, is kind of the missing piece to the puzzle that handles all that for us. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna go ahead and before I even install Argo CD, I'm just gonna go ahead and create a brand new project here. And I'm just gonna call it Argo CD. And feel free, any questions you all may have, feel free to drop them into the chat. We have Red Hatters here that, will, that are here to help you out. Uh, so then what we're gonna do after doing that is we are going to go and click on Argo CD and click on install. And then after clicking install, here we have Argo CD, we have alpha, we have the approval strategy. And um, what we're saying here, this is what's really incredible about this. We're saying install this operator into the Argo CD namespace, okay? 
And then you, thanks to OLM, you have this thing called an approval strategy where you can choose whether or not you want it to install automatically or if you want to review what pieces it's going to install and then approve that. This is comparable. Think about this. If you're an operator author, you have the ability with OLM to push out updates to your users. You actually have the ability to push out new versions of your operators to users. If you're a consumer, you may not want that update to happen um, you know, behind the scenes without your knowledge. You may want to approve it first. This is comparable to like, you know, maybe you have an Android phone or an iPhone and you get, you can turn uh, automatic updates on or off. It's the same concept here. So what we're just going to go ahead and do is I'm going to do a manual strategy and I'm going to install the Argo CD operator to the Argo CD namespace. Now you can see here what it's doing is it's actually going and looking at something called the cluster service version, which is a custom resource definition that OLM provides. The operator author writes the cluster service, um, I'm sorry, the cluster resource definition. And what you can see here is we have a subscription that's been created, which means that I want to get updates for this, but I have to approve them first. And then if I go to requires approval, and go to preview install plan, this shows me what is going to get installed when the operator gets installed, right? So what I'm seeing here are cu custom resource definitions, as you can see here. Uh, I'm seeing the cluster service version. Um, I'm seeing the uh, service accounts. You may be wondering, what, what are all these RBAC artifacts being installed? Understand that when you go and install an operator in a production-like scenario like this, you're not just going to blindly give the default service account with, you know, perhaps cluster admin privileges to a uh, to assign that to a deployment that is running within the cluster. You want to be very restrictive on what permissions you give these operators because they're running in your cluster. And you, it's just kind of comparable to, you know, in the Linux operating system, right? We understand that we don't run everything as root. We want to use kind of like a least privileges type model. So this service account that gets created is going to have a particular role, right? Or cluster role. And that role or cluster role will control which API calls the operator is capable of making. And you can see here the custom resource definitions are gonna be installed and, and everything like that. So let's go ahead and approve it. Now notice right when I approve this, the Argo CD operator is being installed in my cluster. If I hop on over to the command line and I look at the Argo CD environment here, Notice that the Argo CD operator is now running. That's just the operator itself. I actually haven't gone and installed any particular uh, custom resources yet. So the, app, the application itself, also known as the operand, has not, not been installed yet. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and look at our logs here just so we can see this thing spin up and what it looked like when it spun up. So here I'm looking at my operator logs. So you can see that the operator was came up online, it verified that some endpoints were available, and now it's watching for the creation of the Argo CD custom resources. They haven't been created yet. So we can actually go and spin up a window here and we could watch in real time for the creation of those resources. Also something else I want you to take note of is that the CRDs in my environment, and by the way, when you run an OpenShift 4 environment, you get a variety of CRDs that actually get installed and uh, out of the box, right? Because everything is managed by operators, everything. So you, it comes included with CRDs. But I want you to notice in particular that the Argo CD um, CRDs were automatically installed thanks to Operator Lifecycle Manager. Do you see that? So I didn't have to necessarily have cluster admin privileges for those things to get applied. So now if I say OC get Argo CD, right? I don't, have, I don't have any resources created yet, but the endpoint actually exists, right? The endpoint actually exists. So what we want to do is let's go ahead and create an Argo CD. Let's go ahead and get this thing started. How do we get this thing started? Well, let's show you this. 
on the actual dashboard, and we had a question about this actually in the chat. The question was, is there any, what's the best way to kind of have users provide information into a custom resource? Well, let me show you this on the dashboard. If you click on Argo CD, and then from Argo CD, if you actually go and click on create instance, this is our custom resource. There's a variety of custom resources that ship with Argo CD. You can see here that there's two options. One of the options is just having a custom resource that where the user can fill in any desired values. And if you're wondering what possible values, you know, could a user put in here? Well, you would want to look at the explain information or if you wanted, you could look at the instructions here in the description. But this is the really cool part to show you. Thanks to the OpenShift descriptors in OLM, if I click on edit form, I can create that cloud service like experience uh, with forms. So I can actually customize what my user sees here when they go to fill this out and I can actually provide some default values, right? I can turn features on and off here with these switches. I can provide Booleans, all types of really cool stuff to make that experience a lot easier. And if you scroll up in the chat, I presented a little guide on how to customize these descriptors. I put a link to that. Um, definitely check that out. because It tells you all about how when you build an operator, you can build these things in. And it makes the experience really nice for our users. But right now, what I'm going to do is just flip back to our YAML. And I want to show you this in real time. I'm just going to go ahead and watch our controller. I'll do a dash F. Notice that our controller is waiting for the creation of a custom resource. And let's go ahead here and I'm going to just go create my empty custom resource, which should be acceptable. And as soon as I create that custom resource, look at the gap here. Notice we are waiting for the creation of a custom resource. And then suddenly the controller was reconciled, right? Why was it reconciled? Because remember what controllers do. Controllers wait for the creation, update, and delete of the object they're watching. So the Argo CD object was created, right? And the controller saw it and it reconciled it. And now it's running through its comparison of the actual state and declared state that's inside our CR. Well, let's, let's see what it's doing. What could this possibly be doing? What is our operator doing? What is our human operational knowledge doing for us? Well, let's take a look and see. Well, we'll say OC get deployment and notice that this is op this particular operator. Remember, the thing about operators is they provide human operational knowledge. This particular operator is providing for us a series of Kubernetes deployments that represent Argo CD. We have our Argo CD server. We have, it's using Redis as a key value store. We're using DEX, DEX as a way to use OpenShift as an authentic identity provider type, right? So you can imagine, um, this is really awesome by the way, because you can imagine if we already have users um, in our OpenShift environment, Right, that we whether we're using GitHub for authentication or using um, Google or LDAP, what have you, we can use those existing users, have those existing users sign into Argo CD, right? So we don't have to set up a separate group of users for authentication. So the DEX acts as a broker that allows me to specify OpenShift as a identity provider type, if you will. And uh, now we have our application that's actually uh, been created. Um, let's see here. I'm not sure exactly if we have a, um, I don't think it automatically creates a external route for us. No, it doesn't. It's probably something that we have to specify in our custom resource, but at least you see that this part has automatically been set up for us. Let's check out our services. Yes, there we go. Notice that the, look at all this, what the operator did two minutes ago. The operator also set up a service for serving metrics. Why do we care about a service for serving metrics? Because Prometheus, right? Our Prometheus operator that we deployed to this namespace, and by the way, Prometheus operator automatically comes installed in the operator hub, okay? Um, notice here that if you install this to our Argo CD namespace, it will be able to easily scrape these metrics really, really easily. 
And of course, we want to expose our server, our deck server. Um, so you can just see that the operator does a great deal of work in setting this all up for us. If you want to learn more about Argo CD, if you want to learn about more about how this all works, um, feel free to, uh, I know I provided my email in the chat. We also have some great resources on YouTube. Just type in Red Hat Argo CD on how to actually um, utilize it once it's set up. Um, but this is really giving you the overall operator experience, right? The operator kind of look and feel. Now that I have the Argo CD uh, CR actually created and Argo CD is running, right? Uh, if I go to my Argo CD here, I can see that this is my custom resource, right? That represents Argo CD, okay? And of course, if I wanted to give access externally, I would create a route or easily provide a route inside of my custom resource. And notice when, if I want to actually go and delete the operator, I'm just going to go inside here and click on uninstall. Okay. Now this is the operator that is embedded in the operator hub. Please see us if you're interested in getting your app operator inside here. Alternatively, those of you who have no interest in OpenShift, maybe you run a vanilla Kubernetes cluster, you just go to operatorhub.io. And here, these will run in any Kubernetes environment, right? We even have an Argo CD that's been created for upstream. What does that mean? It means that it doesn't rely on any OpenShift objects to do what it does. It knows that it's gonna be running in a vanilla Kubernetes environment. If you're interested in contributing, to the operator hub.io or the embedded operator hub on OpenShift, please check out this link that we provided at uh, workshop.coreostrain.me. If you go to support and you go to submit your operator, you'll notice here that the upstream community operators is where you want to create a pull request. And please read the instructions on creating a pull request, but this is where you're going to do one to uh, put your operator on operator hub.io. Here is where you're going to put your operator that gets featured inside OpenShift. Okay, and it is community supported. If you're interested in having a, uh, uh, an operator that has some sort of enterprise offering that you charge your users for, um, you can check out the Red Hat Marketplace, right? So the Marketplace is a place where you can actually go and offer your enterprise offering. If you're interested in any of this, please come see us. We're happy to help you utilize the power of operators and share it with all the users, not just regular OpenShift, but vanilla Kubernetes as well. So with that said, uh, we have a few minutes left. Were there any questions, any concerns, any, any uh, questions at all? Do we have anything? Feel free to put them in the chat. Sure. Yes. Uh, Red Hat, somebody asked, somebody asked, um, is uh, there a Argo, is there, they want more information on Argo CD. Um, I will see if I can grab this link for you, but uh, anyone from Red Hat, if we look at, there's a great model that, a great example that uh, I think Christian Hernandez put together, together, I have it right here, for deploying Argo CD on OpenShift. And I have the link right here, yes. And I'm going to drop it right here into Mario. Here it comes. I'm oh, sorry. Let's see here. Everyone, here we go. Okay, Mario, check out that link. That will show you how to install Argo CD and use it on OpenShift. Um, Justin Miller asked, what is the best way to start learning more about OLM? Uh, is there a book? We have a free book, if you all didn't catch it. Uh, a couple of Red Hatters have created a free book. Uh, and I'll just go ahead and just share my screen out so you can see that. The free book is available on the website. Workshop.coralwestrain.me. Go to the support tab. Click on this link right here. It's an O'Reilly book written by uh, Jason Dobies and Josh Wood from Red Hat. Tells you all about operators, great book, free download here. Definitely check that out.
Mario, you can run Mario, Mario, you can run the Argo. Mario asks, can you run the Argo CD operator on vanilla Kubernetes? Yes, you can. All you'd have to do is go to operatorhub.io and it's just a couple one-liners to go and install it. You click on install and you go to um, install on Kubernetes. This will install OLM and then this will install your Argo CD operator and this will run on vanilla Kubernetes, Mario. If you have any questions about that or concerns, you can feel free to email me. No problem, happy to help you with that. Okay, all right. Any other questions or concerns? We have a few minutes left. Any other questions? Okay, I think we're all set up here. All right, thank you very much.